get started with this evening's talk, I'm very happy to be able to introduce Dr. Dan Wertheimer from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, we lucked out in the beginning to invite him to be here. He's one of the principals of a, uh, of a committee called CASPER, which studies uh, and is involved in developing high-performance computing solutions for radio astronomy and, and related topics. Well, he was at a conference at NRAO this past week, and he was gracious enough to come up here and speak to us. Um, Dr. Wertheimer is in the Space Sciences Lab at Berkeley. Uh, he does his work on high-performance computing. He's also the chief scientist of the SETI at Home Program, which many of you are familiar with, which is a way for people with spare CPU time to contribute to looking for extraterrestrial signals in waveforms collected by uh, professional radio observatories. So with that, I'll introduce Dr. Gordon. Hi. Thank you, Alan. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. It's a beautiful place, and I hope you get some better weather. Uh, so I want to talk to you about this question, are we alone? Is anybody out there? And uh, you probably know it's called SETI. The field is called SETI, which stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And the, I wanted to start with some of the early SETI ideas. Uh, and then I'll work up to the stuff that we're doing today. Um, so a couple hundred years ago, uh, the mathematician Carl Gauss suggested that we get in touch with ET by making large geometric structures on Earth. So a big triangle made out of pine trees, maybe three, four, five miles on a side, and a big square of dirt, a big square of wheat, big square of water. And the idea was that ET would look down with their Dobsonian big telescopes and see that we knew about the Pythagorean theorem, and then they'd hopefully get in touch with us. And uh, it was a great idea, unfortunately, um, not funded. And then von Littron, uh, also a couple hundred years ago, suggested that we dig a ditch, a circular ditch, um, and fill this ditch with uh, kerosene. It's 20 miles across, and use this match, not to scale, to uh, ignite this bright, make this bright circle of light. And ET, again, would look down with their celestrons and meads and see this bright circle. And, uh, I think you can guess what happened with that. Um, the, uh, Charles Crow suggested that we get in touch with the Martians by reflecting sunlight using mirrors, reflecting sunlight to the Martians, and actually several mirrors, one where he lived in Paris and the others to outline the shape of uh, Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, and um, I think you guess what happened with that. And uh, so the first funded project was to send pornography into space. Uh, so this is the... The plaque, a lot of you may know this, the plaque on the Pioneer 10 spacecraft, and uh, the, the Sun and Mercury, Venus, and Earth, and there's the spacecraft leaving the Earth. And uh, these two creatures were very controversial. Some lines got removed, and they used to be holding hands, and then people were worried, well, they, if they're holding hands, they'll think that's just one creature instead of two. So, um, And there's the spacecraft behind them, so they'll know sort of how big we are. And then, then these are directions to pulsars and the pulsar period, so they'll know where we live and they can come and eat us. So anyway, that was the first funded project. So uh, then, there, then there came the theorists. So they said, well, um, instead of looking, you can just calculate the number of civilizations in the galaxy that we could communicate with. It's called the Drake Equation, named after Frank Drake. So n here, all you have to do is, to get that number, all you have to do is multiply all these things together. And the problem with this equation is that we don't have any idea what any of these numbers are. <laughs> so it's like taking one big unknown and saying it equals a whole bunch of little unknowns. But, well, so I'll, but I'll give you a hint how it works. It's, it's kind of a whittling down process. You start on the left, you start with the number of stars, a couple hundred billion stars in the galaxy. And then as you go, then you say, well, how many of those stars have planets? That's F sub P. And then uh, how many of those stars have the right environment for life. E is the environment, like, do they have the right, is it the right temperature, do they have the right chemicals, everything you need to make life. Uh, and then as you go down the line, so now you got to, first you have a planet, it's the right environment for life, and then once you have this L is how many of those does life actually get started on? Um, so you get the nice planet and you get some algae or some simple cell bacteria or something like that. And that happened pretty quickly on Earth, just as soon as the Earth cooled down life popped up. That was four billion years ago. So we think, a lot of people think, not everybody, but a lot of people think that that primitive life, single-celled creatures, um, very primitive life, might happen frequently, just because it happened quickly here on Earth. Um, 
So at, then you get primitive life, that's the L. Then comes the I, that's intelligence. How often, once you get primitive life, how often does it evolve and become intelligence? That's probably pretty rare. It took four billion years to get to us. Uh, it takes a long time and other, other planets may not have niches where it's good to be smart, you know, it's, it's good to be fast, it's good to have hard shells, it's good, but some ecological niches it's good to be smart and that, that may or may not be true on other planets. So um, then uh, once you get intelligence, the next factor is communication technology. Do they, not only are they smart, but do they develop lasers and do they have radio and things we could use to communicate with them? Do they have big dishes like they have at Green Bank? Um, so, you know, whales are smart, dolphins are smart, but they don't build that kind of stuff. So, uh, and then the last factor is how long do they live? L is longevity. So if they, as soon as they develop technology that we could use to communicate with them, lasers and radio, they might also develop nuclear weapons, chemical weapons and things like that, biological weapons, and they might not last very long. So the Earth is about five billion years old. It's going to last another few billion years before the sun kind of heats it all up. So we could last a long time. Some stars are 10 billion years old, and so there may be civilizations that are billions of years old, older than, than we are. Um, so one of the factors in that equation was how many planets are there. And if you'd asked me 20 years ago, are there planets going around as stars, or any astronomers, we said, well, we think so, but we really don't know. So um, that, as a lot of you know, has all changed in the last 20 years. Uh, the reason it took so long to find planets going around other stars is that planets are really dinky. As you know, a million Earths could fit inside the sun, and the Earth doesn't give off light, it's just reflected light. And so it's like looking for a firefly next to a searchlight. And, you, um, and only in the recent years have we actually been able to image planets. But, so the, the first way they were found 20 years ago was that when a planet goes around the star, it pulls on the star a little bit, the gravity from the planet, not much, but the star wiggles a little bit as the planet goes around it. Um, and that, so here you see this unseen planet, but it's pulling on the star, and, and the star, when it moves away from you, it changes colors a little bit. They call the Doppler shift. It gets a little redder, then a little bluer. And if you see a star moving, it doesn't move much. It just kind of moves at walking speed. So that's a very difficult measurement to make. Anyway, they, they found those about 20 years ago. The first planets were detected, and now we think that that there are a trillion planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. That's more than there are stars. So it looks like most stars have planets and most stars have multiple planet systems. Um, so this is an example of one of these things that where you see the star wiggling and you see it kind of wiggling up and down fast and then you see it wiggling twice. And that's why, because there's two planets going around it, right? The slow one and the fast one. Actually, this one has five planets going around it. And there's another way to find it these planets that you may be familiar with is three years ago this spacecraft called Kepler was launched and the job of that was to find little dinky planets and if you're really lucky the planet occasionally will get in front of the star and then the starlight will dim down. It doesn't dim down very much, a part in a thousand. So you can't do that experiment uh, from the Earth because the stars are dimming on, twinkling all the time because of the atmosphere. Um, but if you go in space the stars are rock steady they're, soup, you know, they're always the same brightness. So if you see one dim down, that means there's something in front of it. And so if the planet comes around, then it plant comes around again. That's called an occultation. Then you know this, th that you found a planet. And, uh, and they found about 3,000 planets so far. Uh, and if you extrapolate, that's how we know. And some of them are pretty small. Earth, they're getting down to these Earth-sized planets. Of course, the first ones they found were big Jupiter-sized kind of things or even bigger because those really pull on the star block a lot of light. But now they can see little dinky things like Earth. Um, now there may even be life in our own solar system. And this is, uh, as you probably know, a moon around uh, Jupiter, Europa. And um, underneath, it's, it's got ice on the top, but underneath the ice we think there's a liquid ocean. Um, we're trying to figure out how to drill down through that ice or get through that ice, but the pro it's about 50 miles thick. But there may be something swimming around down there. There are a few other moons that look interesting that have liquid water. Um, so we, we don't know how life got started exactly, but maybe in something like this primordial soup. And, and people have done experiments where they tried to simulate the early conditions on Earth. So um, you put in a flask, you put in some methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen. This is what was around when the Earth was getting started. And then you put in some sparks to simulate lightning. And you don't get gorillas crawling out of this thing, but you do get um, the basic building blocks of life, the amino acids that that you and I are made of. So we're beginning to understand how life got started. 
Um, but it's, there's still some unknowns. Some people think it's formed in ice. Some people form, formed in clay where you have these grooves where you can get molecules kind of lining up for RNA and DNA. Uh, and the cracks in ice can model, but we really don't know. Um, so, oh, by the way, feel free to interrupt with questions and comments. So, if there is life out there, how are we going to get in touch? So, one of the, uh, the ideas that's about more than 100 years old is that the Earth is sending off radio and television out into space. And, uh, and maybe, since we do that, maybe ET does that too. And so, this is a plot of television power leaving the Earth as a function of 1940, 1950, 1960, and you can see the Earth is getting brighter. We're growing exponentially brighter. Uh, we're brighter than the sun right now at television frequencies. So we're pretty easy to detect at television frequencies. We send a lot of radar and navigational beacons. FM radio is pretty strong. Um, and the, um, but you might notice that the Earth is not growing as fast as we used to, and I think that's because we're going to more directed communication uh, there's still television transmitters, but there's also now you can get your TV on a cable or it's from satellites and stuff that don't leak a lot of power. Um, and so we're a little worried about that. That means that very advanced civilizations, they may not just blast stuff off into space the way that television transmitters blast into space. But anyway, right now we're very bright. So the idea is that ET might be having have some kind of communication that we could detect, television, radar, um, some, some kind of radio signal that we could detect. Or if we're very lucky, maybe they're even transmitting a signal deliberately toward us because intentional kind of communication. We've sent intentional communications from Earth. This was a message uh, sent in 1974, and uh, it was sent to, I believe, the globular cluster M13. And uh, the, uh, so the, uh, this consists of a sequence of zeros and ones. And if ET's clever, they'll figure out that they should turn these zeros and ones into black and white squares or ultraviolet and infrared squares or whatever their vision is. And then they'll see this image. And, and again, here's the solar system with the, with the sun and um, Mercury and Venus and Earth tipped toward this person. And this is the radio telescope, the Arecibo telescope that it was sent in. This is the diameter of the telescope. This is, anybody see what that is? That DNA. DNA, right. And these are the amino acids that you and I are made of. And these are some binary numbers. But remember, they have some time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking for both kinds of signals. We're looking for artifacts that just accidentally leave their planet the way that television leaves off our planet. Uh, so I Love Lucy left this planet 50 years ago and has gone past 10,000 stars. The, the nearby stars have seen The Simpsons. Yeah. Yeah, so we send a variety of things. We, the television is actually pretty weak because it goes off in all directions. So we could detect television if it was on a nearby star with our big telescopes like the one in Green Bank. But we couldn't detect it very far away. But then Earthlings also send off more powerful things. There's these things called the BMUS radars, the ballistic missile early warning radar systems. During the Cold War, the Russians were interested in missiles coming their way and the US was interested in missiles coming its way, and in Alaska we have these big things, and they, they're a little more focused. They, 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 they sweep across the sky, so it's a little more intense than just broadcasting every which way. Does and those, anything, or is it just... No, you just hear a blip, and then it goes by blip. So you wouldn't, there's not communication there. So they know that we're here, but they wouldn't really know much about us. Um, but they could recognize it kind of artificial. It's not something that looks natural. Um, and then, the most powerful thing we send is when we send very directed things, like we, that, that message that I showed you. That was sent by a telescope that, in Puerto Rico that's used to bounce signals off planets and study the atmosphere. And that sends out this pencil beam. And, it, and uh, it's a megawatt transmitter. And that thing, could, they could hear that on the other side of the galaxy, 100,000 light years uh, away. If they had Arecibo on Earth talking to Arecibo, on the other side of the galaxy, they could communicate with each other. Of course, it's kind of, you send a message and gets there in 100,000 years, and then they, you know, so it's not, hi, how's your mom? It's, uh, it's more like, here's our Library of Congress, here's all our music, poetry, literature, science, it medicine. Beam, or does it, go out like it goes, that one goes out as a very narrow beam, and that's why it's so intense, and that's why 
they could receive it on the other side of the galaxy, even with a kind of Earth kind of technology. But then you kind of hope that they're pointing something in our direction. And that would be kind of a more deliberate thing, like they know about us, they've seen smog in our atmosphere, oxygen from photosynthesis, they've been watching, oh, we should talk to those guys. And then they might beam something in our direction. Or maybe they just scatter shot around just trying to talk to all the nearby stars. Yeah, so these things, the, whether we should transmit or not is, is controversial. And I actually, and I'm, uh, most SETI people think we should just be listening, just do passive experiments. And we think that advanced civilizations are going to be peaceful. You know, they, they may be, maybe we're killing each other now, but eventually if we're going to live for a long time, we're going to have to figure out how to. So we think advanced civilizations are, but that may be naive. So w what I think we should do is only just listen for a while and figure out what's out there, if anything. Uh, and not do these, um, so that, those are, that's called passive SETI, just listening, and not do active SETI, which is transmitting out. Um, however, there are a few people that disagree with me, and they do it for kind of for publicity stunts or fundraising or something like that, and there have been messages sent out. And they, the one that I showed you was deliberately sent to something that's, I think, 10,000 light years away or something. So it's, they're not sending, so if they're going to come eat us, it's going to be a while. Uh, <laughs> but some people said, no, just send it to the nearby guys. So don't hold your breath. Um, so, uh, okay, so I'm not the first guy to come up with this idea that we should look for radio signals. The guys that uh, discovered radio, Tesla, Marconi, 100 years ago, they thought, hey, maybe ET's broadcasting, and they did these experiments. And they actually thought that they found ET, they found radio signals that... They, and there were big headlines in the paper, extraterrestrials. And it turned out, they didn't know it at the time, but they were listening to distant lightning bolts thousands of miles away. And when the lightning bounces up and down in the eye atmosphere, it, it, it turns into something called a whistler, a, a, a chirping yoke. <laughs> and they heard that, that sound, and they thought that was E.T. trying anyway. So, and then uh, Frank Drake, right here in Green Bank, just an hour's drive from here, did a more modern experiment, looked at three different stars at the hydrogen line. And, and that kind of launched a whole bunch of SETI experiments. And I got involved about 35 years ago and, uh, and launched the, the Berkeley program. Uh, so um, there are about two dozen people on the planet who, um, who do SETI. And not a lot of, there's not a lot of money and not a lot of resources and not many people work on this. There's a, there's a group in California called the SETI Institute. There's our group at Berkeley. There's a group in Australia, Argentina. Actually, when I say a group, there's one guy there, one guy there, one guy in Italy. There's two guys at Harvard, uh, one guy at Lick Observatory in California. Turns out we have the biggest group. We have like a dozen people working on this. Um, and uh, we're funded by the National Science Foundation and NASA. And we get some donations from uh, companies that give us the computers we need and some of the high-tech electronics and stuff that we need. Um, and most of those people, though, are students that work in my group that, uh, um, so we don't, so it's not really expensive. We have, we pay the students a little bit to work on this. And one of the problems in SETI is that um, we don't know what frequency the ET might be broadcasting on. Are they going to send something in the FM band or the TV band or the, uh, or maybe it's a, they use laser beams and uh, visible wavelengths or infrared wavelengths. So we, we do try to do a bunch of experiments. Uh, we have some optical telescopes. Uh, we have an infrared telescope. We have a, um, we use the, this telescope that I think a lot of you are going to um, on Sunday, the Green Bank Telescope um, that, that's right here in, in West Virginia. Um, we use the Arecibo Telescope at the lower frequencies in Puerto Rico. Um, and so we have these different experiments. Some of them look for radio signals. Some of them look for optical signals. Some look for infrared experiments. We're trying a lot of different things because it's hard to guess what ET might be doing. So the first search that, that uh, we did was funded by NASA. And NASA requires that you use acronyms. So <laughs> Serendip is the search for extraterrestrial radio missions from nearby developed and intelligent populations. And we use this telescope. Um, this is right in your backyard. This is uh, at Green Bank. And it's, uh, this one is um, 300 feet across. This is, uh, it's just the same as the telescopes that you guys would set up tonight. Um, on the ridge there if it were clear. Um, this is a mirror. It's just a big uh, metal mirror instead of a glass mirror, but 
it, you know, the, the waves come in and they, they're collected at the focus here. That's where you put your receiver. Um, but it's not a, you know, it's not a 12 inch telescope. This is 300 feet across. There's a full size person down here. The reason you can build them big is because the mirrors don't have to be as smooth. At radio wavelengths you can get by with, I think the one at, um, at Green Bank, it's a perfect parabola to uh, within one two thousandths of an inch. But that would be horrible at visible wavelengths. You've got to be you know, down to a millionth of an inch or something like that. Um, so anyway, while we're using that telescope, sorry, while we're using that telescope, um, this is what happened to it. Uh, and you might ask, how did that happen? And uh, according to the World <laughs> Weekly News, um, the, the aliens did not want to be discovered. And that's actually kind of an interesting theory because this is another telescope we use in California. Uh, and while we were using this telescope, that's what happened to that telescope. <laughs> and so we're testing the zap theory now at this telescope. <laughs> uh, and this is, um, I, I think a lot of you have been here and you're gonna, a lot of you are going there on, on Sunday, at, at the Green Bank Telescope. It's the world's largest um, steerable telescope. It's uh, 100 meters across. And this one was built to replace the one I showed you, the big one that collapsed. And you guys were lucky to have a very powerful Senator uh, Bird. It's called the Robert C. Bird Telescope. Raised the money for this thing, the $150 million. Um, now, it, so it didn't come out of my budget for SETI. It, but, so it's used for all kinds of things, you know, to study how the universe began and how stars are born and how galaxies form. And, but, at the same time it's used to do that stuff, we're doing SETI experiments on it. We call it piggyback SETI. We go along for a ride. Wherever the astronomers are pointing, we check to see if there are signals from extraterrestrials. And that, um, that way we get a lot of telescope time. Um, we don't get to point the telescope, but we don't know where to look anyway. So, and then we also use this. This is the main telescope we use. This is the, um, yeah, so this one, um, a, uh, there was some steel plate that held up a bearing. It lasted a long time. I think it lasted 40 years. And there was some steel plate that the plan said to make it out of half inch steel. Uh, sorry, out of three quarter inch steel. It made a half inch steel. And that sheared and the whole, that was holding up the bearing and the whole thing smashed onto the ground. And there's a building underneath it. And I'd just been in the building like an hour before, but yeah. Yeah, it made a hell of a noise. <laughs> uh, the, um, so anyway, this is the world's largest radio telescope in, in Puerto Rico. It's a thousand feet across. Um, so it's, uh, this thing holds 10 billion bowls of cornflakes. And it, it's, it's the same idea that this is the aluminum mirror that reflects the radio waves up to the top. and then. But the, this one, you can't steer it at all, like the Green Bank Telescope. So the way you move, you, this dish is fixed in the ground. You might have seen it in uh, James Bond GoldenEye. But in, in, the, in the GoldenEye, it comes up out of the water. It doesn't really do that. Um, but it was also in the movie Contact, which was a book written by Carl Sagan, who worked with us um, when he was alive and knew a lot about SETI. So it, the movie Contact is more accurate than GoldenEye. And um, it's the... Uh, Anyway, so the, the radio waves bounce off this dish, and, and the receiver up here that's inside this dome, there's actually a secondary and a tertiary mirror. Um, it's called a Gregorian optical system. Anyway, the receiver's up there. So the way this thing, you point it, is you can move this receiver along this track, and then the whole thing swings around in this azimuth arm. It's kind of Dobsonian-like. It's got an azimuth elevation kind of mount. Um, and, uh, and you can cover about a third of the sky with this telescope um, by waiting for the Earth to rotate and moving this receiver around. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that we want to look at in SETI that Arecibo can't see. In particular, remember I showed you the, that Kepler spacecraft that's looking at all the planets that they found, 3,000 planets. That thing is at about 60 degrees declination. All those planets are right 60 degrees dec. And Arecibo can't, can't see those planets. So we, we need to, uh, we use the Green Bank Telescope for that. And we have a, a, a cryogenic receiver at the focus there that looks at seven places at a time. And the, one of the early ideas in SETI, that what we went after was 
just finding some strong frequency at some, uh, some strong signal at some frequency. And the problem is you don't know what frequency, what channel they'd be broadcasting on. So we built these multi-channel spectrum analyzers, we call them. Um, and uh, so here's channel number 2,264,181. Here's channel number 2,264,959. And here's a strong signal at one of those channels. That's the kind of thing that we were looking for. And I wish I could tell you it was ET, but it was just a satellite going over Arecibo. Um, it's, it's very similar to just kind of tuning your radio dial, looking at the signal strength meter. You tune it across and all of a sudden you see the signal strength meter up. That's what go up. That's what gets our attention. But it, it's a little different than that because when you're tuning, you're kind of looking at one channel at a time. And we would build these things that would look at all the billions of channels at a time. But it's the same idea. Um, so this is another kind of thing that we want to look for. Instead of something staying at a fixed frequency, we're looking for signals that might change in frequency. So here's one that's going down in frequency. And these ones are going up in frequency. And that might happen because the transmitter is probably on a spinning planet and that's, that acceleration as it goes around introduces the Doppler shift. And we don't know how fast their planets are spinning and, and so we have to look for these kind of chirping signals. And that's a little harder to do with a computer. Your eyes can see this pretty well. I think you can all see these lines. But we have about 100 million of these things to look at every second. And uh, so we take a lot of eyeballs. And then we, we also want to look for pulsing signals, a bip, 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 bip. And uh, that's harder to see with your eye, so I've circled them here. Um, and, uh, and so we want to do that. And we have about 100 million of these things to look at every second. So there's a lot of, lot of sort of computing or eyeballs that we need to kind of go through our data. So what we did is we, we, um, we stored the data. We take the data at Arecibo or at Green Bank, and we store it on this big supercomputing center. We have about a petabyte of data, a huge amount of data. These are robotic things that store this data for us on these thousands and thousands of disk drives. And then what we did is we asked the public for help analyzing the data. Um, so we couldn't possibly analyze it ourselves with our computers at, at the university. So what we did is um, we built this little screensaver program called SETI at Home. Uh, how many of you are actually running SETI at Home? Do you guys know about this? Oh, okay, a fair amount of you already know all, everything I'm going to say. But anyway, for the uninitiated, um, what you do, there's a little program that you can download on your home computer or at the office or at school. It's called the SETI at Home Screensaver. And what we do is we take the data from Arecibo or Green Bank here, and we break the data up into little pieces. Everybody gets 107 seconds of data. So you'll get one piece of the sky, you'll get a different part of the sky. And when you, when you install the screensaver, you'll, you'll also get, be assigned one of these pieces of data from a, one, some chunk of the sky. And you'll have to go through that. Your computer goes through that looking for all the different possible radio frequencies and signal types and those pulses and drifting signals. There's a lot of things it's looking for. Right now it's looking for one of these Gaussian things um, that's shown. Well, as you go over a, a, a star or a planet, you'd expect it to get stronger and then weaker and it would trace out this bell-shaped curve, and we look for that kind of thing. And then also on the screen, it reminds you what your name is and how much work you've donated to the project, and what this is the right ascension declination, you know, where, what part of the sky you're looking at, and when it was recorded, and what frequency you're looking at. And then, um, <coughs> and uh, it, let's see if I got, I have, this is what it looks like when it's actually running on, on your computer. Um, and uh, then after a few days, it finishes analyzing that part of the, it depends on how long you leave your computer on and how often you go out for a cup of coffee. But anyway, after a few days it finishes and then it, it's not supposed to stop like that. But um, the, um, then it'll send the results, any strong signals that it found, back to our server in Berkeley. Uh, and then you get a new piece of data to work on from a different part of the sky. And you just keep doing that until you find ET. And, uh, and the, you get the Nobel Prize. Your name is attached to all the pieces of the sky that you've analyzed. And, um, and if you're a lucky one that finds that faint murmur from a distant civilization, you get the Nobel Prize, but there's a catch. So the catch is that there are 8 million people who have downloaded the SETI at Home screensaver. Nobel Prize is about a million and a half dollars. So that comes out to, I don't know, about 20 cents a person. So you're not going to get rich. Um, but it's a, kind of a fun thing to do. You might get famous. So uh, it, it turned out SETI at Home uh, is the... It was the biggest supercomputer on the planet, thanks to all the volunteers. It still is, if you, but we've changed it a little bit so you can do other science. And that the volunteers 
um, have donated so far about three million years of computing time. They donate a thousand years a day. It means if we just had one computer, it would take a, a thousand years to do what the volunteers do for us in one day. Um, and uh, it's the biggest computation that's ever been done on this planet anyway. And we still haven't found ET. So if you, want, if you want to participate in SETI at home, you don't have to do this, but if you want, you can put on, you can uh, go to the website and put information about yourself that other people can see. It's called a user profile. You can post a little picture. I'm an artist living in San Francisco. I paint murals. Um, you can say whatever you want. And then you can also join teams, or you can make your own team. Um, and uh, there's, uh, I think, about 50,000 teams. There's primary school teams, secondary, junior colleges, university, small, medium, large size companies. And the teams kind of compete with each other in somewhat friendly ways. This is uh, Sun and IBM has donated 2,800 years of computing time and they're ahead of Microsoft. And so this competition has led to some bizarre behavior. <laughs> so then, uh, and I wish I could say that was kind of the main, the main motivator for people running SETI at home is that they're really excited about astronomy and SETI and are we alone, but a lot of it is like, my computer's faster than your computer, and look at how much work I've done. And, and so there are these guys um, that build these clusters of computers in their basements. And you can go to this website called setifarm.org and all these guys that are competing with each other. And by the way, they're all guys. They're no... Uh, here's another uh, example of somebody that's built one of these SETI clusters to run SETI at home. And that guy, I don't know why... <laughs> If, if you know why he's carrying those bolt cutters, please see me after. I'm curious. And so here's another funny thing that happened. This guy, uh, you can buy these work units on eBay. Um, if you want to get look at like you've done a lot of work and you haven't done a lot of work for SETI at home, you can, this guy will, uh, he's auctioning off 7,000 work units. And if you win this auction, he will transfer his credits over to your account so look like you've done a huge amount of work. He wants to do it so he can break his habit. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, a unique chance to join the elite top 0.18% of SETI users. Uh, and uh, I'm auctioning off my SETI units in hope of breaking my SETI at home habit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe I should warn you guys. So one of the things that we're really, we haven't found ET, but one of the things we're very happy about is that there are a lot of kids running SETI at home, and we've developed this curriculum um, for kids that, um, so, sorry, everything okay? Yeah, yeah the cable, the cable, cable is closed. Oh, okay. So, um, this question, are we alone, is kind of a fun question for kids. Everybody, all kids are excited about ET, and that if they get in, interested in this question, it touches on a lot of areas of science, not just astronomy, but you can learn some physics, you can learn about biology and evolution and chemistry and you can learn about computing and uh, so it, we developed some curriculum with the Lawrence Hall of Science and it's used by a lot of teachers all over the world um, to get kids interested in science as they run the SETI at home screensaver and we have some curriculum about are we alone. So this is what comes out of the, the, uh, the all that, the, um, when people send us their results, and we have to go through it and look what, what's really interesting. We make a list of the things that are really exciting. So this is one of the things that we were excited about, is that um, uh, this is a little map of the sky, declination, right ascension, and here's a little piece of the sky. The telescope went through it three times on three different days, and every time we saw the same kind of signal at the same frequency, one of these Gaussian things at the same place in the sky, and we said, wow, it's always there. Um, if we just see one, if we just see it once, it might be a satellite or a thing, uh, some kind of interference. Radio interference is getting worse and worse on this planet. Um, and even though we're in this radio quiet zone, this is the best place to put a radio telescope in the continental U.S. Um, um, you know, nobody's allowed to have transmitters. I think way all far away from Greenbank, so it's a good place. But it, there's still a lot of interference, and it's getting harder and harder to do these SETI experiments uh, on the planet. We're working on a telescope in the desert in South Africa um, because it's uh, 120 degrees and there's no water and nobody lives there and there are not that many transmitters. But eventually the Earth is going to be filled with radio transmitters and, and uh, we'll have to go to the backside of the moon or something to be, and that'll, co that'll cost a zillion dollars and 
America's broke. So this may be a kind of unique window in Earthling's history where we kind of have the technology to do these SETI experiments, but we're not totally polluted all the radio bands. Anyway, this is the kind of thing that we end up with is kind of list of these candidates. And then we go back to the telescope and check them out. But so far, um, none of the candidates have, uh, have uh, turned out to have anything interesting. Um, but I think we've got a long way to go. We're just learning how to do this. So this SETI at Home uh, project uh, led to this kind of more general purpose public participation scientific computing. We call it distributed computing um, or edge resource aggregation when you ask volunteers, citizen science. And we wrote this code that was a little more general so that people could um, participate in lots of projects with their home computer. And uh, there's now like a hundred different things of people using this software. By the way, all the code that we write is open source and um, it's written by volunteers. Yeah? Um, when you were putting up the example of, you know, that's kind of what you all look for, that Gaussian. Yeah, that, the Gaussians, yeah. So based on my extensive watching of community contact, uh -huh. um, I, <laughs> when you do something like this, how do you determine whether it is something or not? Yeah. So the main way you go there, you go back and you look again. And you check, and so you, you, then you need dedicated telescope time. You can't go f just kind of wait until they go back there. But if you're really anxious, you, you, you write a proposal, and they say, oh, okay, it's pretty cool. We'll let these guys have a little time. It's free to get on telescope. Anybody can write a proposal. It's funded by the National Science Foundation, Arecibo, and the, and the Green Bank. So you, if, you, if they like your proposal, they say, okay, you get some time. You, and, and then you go back and you point the telescope at those places. And then, and then we kind of study them in detail with do more sensitive stuff and put it on the biggest supercomputers and look kind of exhaustively. Um, and then, 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 then if we see nothing, we actually still keep it on the list. And the reason that we still keep it on the list is because maybe the signals are not all the time. And maybe we go back there, we didn't see it, but maybe they just weren't broadcasting that day or something. That's what I was going to ask. I mean, so this is something. Yeah. I think it might be something. You go look at it. You don't find anything for the right. was it? Yeah, we don't right? know. We, it's probably interference. You're not supposed to have cell phones anywhere near um, the, the telescopes, but there are people that you know, try to, of course, the cell phone doesn't work there because there's no reception, but people sometimes do that. It could be um, just people taking pictures with digital cameras creates radio signals and they get in the telescope. And so they don't allow digital cameras there, they, it, when you can buy a film camera, because there's no electronics in there. But even, even, uh, even automatic film cameras, you can really have one of those still, even those cross Yeah, you need an old camera. Yeah. But they, they, sell the, they sell the cheap ones, you know, the, the $5 mm -hmm. cameras there for people who want to take pictures. Um, but yeah, anything with, the, with electronics pretty much radiates radio frequencies. And, and so we think that these things are interference. But we, we're not sure. That's why we go back and keep checking them out. And, uh, and you, I'm sure you sometimes find these natural resources. That yeah, we do, but we have ways to discard those. We find pulsars and other kinds of things. Um, in fact, we found a few interesting things that way. Um, but so far, we haven't had a confusion between natural radio sources and extraterrestrial radio sources uh, technology. OK. so. Um, this, this thing led to this um, concept where we wrote this code so that you could plug in all kinds of scientific projects and, and now you can use your computer not just to do SETI, but you can use your spare computing cycles to look for gravity waves or hunt for new planets or um, uh, do global warming research, climate prediction. There's a lot of uh, drug research. You can uh, look for cancer drugs, malaria drugs, HIV drugs. Um, and. Uh, and you can, you can allocate how you want your computer to be used. So you can say you want 20% of your spare computing cycles to go for SETI and 30% for climate prediction project and 40% for gravity wave project. Yeah, whatever you're interested in, you can pick the projects you're interested in. This is a protein folding project, a biology project. The idea is that there's a lot of computing power out there and, and, and now there's a billion machines on the internet. So almost all the computing power is actually in little machines that you and I own at home or at the office. And so you can build big supercomputers out of that stuff. So that led to this thing called thinking at home to ask people to do things that computers are not good at, um, where you need uh, eye, like pattern recognition, things that your eyes are, can pick up, we, the things that computers are not good at. And our first project was we sent this spacecraft out past Jupiter called Stardust. And its job was to collect 
the dust particles that were around in, in between the planets that are, were around at the beginning of the solar system. We wanted to find out how the planets were forming and what the dust, the early dust particles were made of. And there, the planets formed, but there's still some dust left over. They formed out of this dust, but there's still dust in between the planets. So we went out past Jupiter and we scooped up this dust. And uh, it was, um, we scooped it up with this foam called aerogel and we just flew through there and the little particles of dust get stuck in the foam. They're traveling very fast at twice the speed of a bullet. They get buried in the foam somewhere. And then we brought that foam back to Berkeley and then we, uh, we had to go look in that aerogel to see if we could find any little primordial dust particles. And then we wanted to figure out how they, what they were made of. And the problem is there are little microscopic particles that are in there somewhere. So we thought at first we would, to find these little microscopic particles, we'd need about a thousand students looking through a microscope for a couple years, scanning the dust. And what we did instead was we just took millions of photographs of the, of the, with, a, with an automated microscope that would look at all the different places in the dust and look at different depths. And, and then we sent that out to volunteers and we called it the Stardust at Home Project. Um, and uh, that what the volunteers did was they, they you, you can run this program, we got about, I think 40,000 volunteers. You can get little training, what does the dust particle look like? What does a false alarm look like? And then you, you start looking at, you, you have a kind of run a virtual microscope and then you, we found dust particles that the students would have missed that we, little tiny ones that turned out to be um, very interesting and we're beginning to learn about sort of how the planets formed out of this dust and what the dust is made of uh, thanks to those volunteers. And that led to a whole bunch of citizen science projects. Um, our first one was Stardust, but now there's a, a lot of these projects. Not all of them use the R code, but some of them do. Uh, oh, I want to tell you a little bit about other SETI searches that we're doing. I, I mentioned that we, most of what we do is look for radio signals, but we also do optical, uh, you know, visible wavelength searches. Um, this one is uh, looking for pulsed laser beams, uh, just a bright flash. It turns out you can make a laser here on Earth that's brighter than the sun, but it's only brighter than the sun for a nanosecond, you know, a billionth of a second. Um, and we can outshine the sun if, for a bright, for, um, so we, that would be pretty easy to detect. It just, um, we can use a small telescope. This is uh, 0.8 meters, you know, 30 inches across. That's right near Berkeley in California. And we point, and uh, we're looking for these laser flashes. We're also doing an experiment like that at uh, Lick Observatory in California. And this is uh, me and Frank Drake and my student Shelley and Rem Stone, who's the head of the observatory. And this is a this is a 40-inch telescope, and this is our uh, SETI equipment down here that looks for these pulses. And then we're we've also got an experiment on the Keck telescope um, uh, at uh, in Hawaii. These are two 10-meter. Uh, Dish mirrors. They're actually not single mirrors 10 meters across. Um, they're made out of, I think, 192 different mirrors all stuck together. Um, we're also working on trying to figure out how to build the next generation of radio telescopes. So this big dish that you've seen or you will see on Sunday, um, it's really expensive to make those things, these giant telescopes. So we're trying to figure out how to make telescopes out of lots and lots of little telescopes. And the reason these things are cheap, you, you can see this one being kind of stamped out here in a, in a mold. And, um, and then you can put these things together in an array of, of lots of little telescopes, and that's a lot cheaper than building a giant telescope. And that's what the meeting was about this week. That's why I'm here in Virginia, is we're trying to figure out how to build these next generation of, of radio telescopes, making them out of lots and lots of little telescopes. And the problem with that has traditionally been that you need, you have to connect all these signals together from all these little telescopes. And, and that takes a lot of computing power and, and that's been expensive, but now computing power is getting really cheap and it's actually cheaper. So we think we know how to do it and we're beginning to do that. And that's leading to this thing called the square kilometer array, which is a 4,000 dishes and it will be built in uh, South Africa in the desert that I was talking about where it's very quiet. No, nobody likes to live there because there's no water and it's, it's really hot. Um, but there are, anyway, so that's a big international project, and we've built seven telescopes there right now. We're scaling it up to 64, these early prototypes, and, and then after 64, we'll build another thing that's maybe a couple hundred telescopes. And then we hope, if, um, this is not just for SETI, this is a big expensive thing for the astronomy community, but if the astronomy community builds it and the physics community builds it, then we'll, 
we'll go there. So this is a kind of summary of our data. If you've been asleep, this is the kind of quick summary. 30 trillion fruitless tries. If we count all the channels and frequencies and signal types. But scientists keep searching for ET. Actually, now we're up to a million trillion fruitless tries. So we haven't found ET, but I'm, I'm actually optimistic that if there are radio signals out there, I think eventually Earthlings will be able to find them. And the, the reason I'm optimistic is because I think we've, we're just scratching the surface. We're just learning how to do this. We're an emerging civilization. We've only had radio 100 years. Computers have only been around a few decades. And um, if you look at all the searches that our group has done and other groups have done, um, it, this is a, a plot of all these different SETI searches. And I, even though I'm really proud, this is um, how much of the sky they've covered, how much of the frequency band they've covered, how sensitive they are. But what I want you to notice here is that there's a lot of things that, that um, nobody's looking at. So this is frequency out here. And if ET's broadcasting at this frequency, we haven't done any searching at that frequency. We've only searched down here. So if radio signals could be coming right through the roof of this yurt, um, if they were out at 10 gigahertz, they'd, we'd miss them. So we have a lot more to do before we can say we're doing thur thur thorough searches. I think we call it the cosmic haystack, like looking for a needle in a haystack. There's a lot of, yeah. lot of parameters. You know about the cosmic haystack. Mm -hmm. So the cosmic in, haystack. In a, in a show. Oh, OK, cool. So the, this, this cosmic haystack is, we, I think we've covered like about a billionth of it, a little tiny piece, looking for this needle. If you think of all the possible stars that you'd have to look at and all the different frequencies and signal types. So you said that, our, that we think the populations that we'd be looking at might be a billion years ahead of us. Can you look at our development and our history and say where we're going to be in a billion years? And, and yeah. expect to and well, where we might be it's hard for me to predict where we're going to be next year, but I can, yeah. I, can uh, I, I have a slide about that, actually. Okay. So, when, when I started doing this, we listened to 100 channels at once in, in the 70s. And, and the, remember I said that one of the problems is we don't know what channel to listen to. So the more channels you can listen, the better. So we thought, I thought that was great. I was like, it was the best SETI experiment ever. Everybody was really excited about what we did. And then uh, in the 80s, we built a thing that could listen to 65,000 channels. And then in the 90s, we built a thing that could listen to 4 million channels. And then we built a thing, and now we're listening to 5 billion channels at once. And it's not because I'm just smarter. It's, it's because the computing power is growing exponentially, and we're just taking advantage of the billions of dollars that go into Silicon Valley and all that money pouring in there. To, and we just go along for the ride, riding the Moore's Law curve. And the capabilities have been almost doubling every year. So that's like a factor of a million. SETI experiments got a factor of a million better over 20 years. And, and um, now, I don't know if that trend's going to continue. And, and a lot of this discussion at this meeting that I am coming from today is, was about how much further we can expect that to happen and can we really leverage this. This is a plot of computing power as a function of time. Nin, uh, from 1900, to, here's 2000. And right now, computers are about as smart as a guppy or maybe a lizard. Now, if this trend continues, the capabilities are doubling every 18 months, by the time we get to about 2030, computers will be as smart as humans. And that means com computers can start designing themselves. That's called the singularity. And that, that's kind of an interesting time that computing power could even grow faster than that. A lot of bad things could happen too. Um, but anyway, if, if this trend continues, um, and it's really kind of an economic trend, it's like, are people, do they really need computers? And it's driven a lot by the gaming industry. It's driven by, you know, nerds playing games and they're, uh, that, um, you know, all night. But anyway, they're the people that want a lot of computing power. But as long as that money flows into Silicon Valley or into China or something like that, I think it'll continue for a while. Um, but I can't, I can maybe extrapolate to 2030, but I'm not, you asked about a billion years from now. I'm, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Where's our technology heading in terms of us being able to Yeah, we're moving to higher and higher frequencies because they go to higher, more bits per second you can get on at higher frequencies. And we're starting to think about how we're going to communicate with spacecraft with laser beams instead of radio beams, although it's really hard to point those things. So you would think that those civilizations might realize that they're trying to talk to civilizations a billion years 
behind. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. It, the, a civilization a billion years ahead of us, we're going to look like ants to them. So it's a kind of, are they going to be interested in ants? Are they going to study us? Are they going to try to, we don't really try to communicate with ants. So um, there, may, there may be kind of motivational question. But on the other hand, there may be a big intergalactic ether, uh, you know, internet, and maybe they're all talking to each other. And even though we're still primitive and killing each other, maybe they would welcome us to their club. I don't know. It's, it's hard to speculate, but I, one of the trends that I would kind of maybe speculate on is um, the, uh, that um, I think we're going to become more kind of machine-like. I mean, already people are getting pacemakers and hearing aids, and some blind people are getting things in their eyes, and I think, so we're starting to wear more silicon. It's just a trend, but I think eventually we're going to become sort of Borg-like and and I think it might be that advanced civilizations that we talk to will be more kind of, we'll be talking to machines. But we don't care. As long as they're interested in communication, we can probably learn a lot from them. Um, the other trend is, um, that's interesting is the population probably going to peak and go down starting around 2050. And um, another interesting trend is that we're going to live forever. If you plot the age of humans as a function of time, I think in about two or three generations, people will live forever. You know, we'll grow spare parts and stuff. I don't know how we're going to do it, but, um, and, and I'm kind of angry that after 100,000 generations, I kind of missed it by about three generations. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, what, if, what if ET's not transmitting radio signals? Um, We've been thinking a little bit about this, or what if they're not transmitting laser signals? So um, this is a thing that we don't really know how to do, but the Europeans are working on this, and NASA's been thinking about this, is to build a whole bunch of telescopes in space. And the idea of this thing is to take the spectrum of the atmosphere of a distant planet. And then if you could do that, you could find the chemical constituents of, a, of the atmosphere and then you could tell if there's oxygen in the atmosphere. And oxygen would mean there's photosynthesis. So that means we could, we could see plants or detect the presence of plants and know that there's primitive life on a distant planet. We don't know how to do that now, but that's something that may come in our lifetimes. Um, the other thing that's a little further away is that the sun actually makes a really good telescope. So the sun bends light just like a mirror, like, uh, sorry, like a lens. And, uh, and, uh, and it, but the, the, as it bends the light, the problem is it comes to a focus at 1,000 astronomical units, which is way beyond Pluto. So you've got to put your camera out there. We're not sure how to do that. But uh, if you could do that, you put a camera out at the 1,000 AU and, and then kind of put your finger in front of the sun to block the sunlight and use the sun as a lens, um, then you could read license plates on an extrasolar planet. But this is probably more like 100 or 1,000 years away. That's, that's, Kind of speculative, but that'd be a big telescope. You, that's a telescope the size of a sun. That's bigger than a than a mead. So, here's a summary. Uh, no ET so far. Uh, still working on it. Um, so that's kind of the main slide that you need to kind of t take away from this talk. Um, if you want to learn more. There's, go to this website, or this also this website is a good place to download the SETI at Home screensaver. And I, the people that are here, here running it, we really appreciate it. We couldn't have done this work without you. And uh, and um, there's also on this website there's a fun thing that you might enjoy called the Great Debate. And this guy Jeff uh, Marcy, he's a planet finder. He's found hundreds, actually thousands of planets now. And uh, he wore all black. And he said, Dan, you're wasting your time. You're never going to find ET. They're not out there. And then I wore all white. And said, any day now, you just, you know, all we need is another couple of couple more channels in our spectrometer. And uh, anyway, we debated for a while and back and forth, and we had a good debate and a lot of questions. And uh, and uh, we, it was, it's on the website. You can watch this thing, and then you can vote for who you think won. And um, I hope you'll vote for me. And right now, I'm winning, but it wouldn't hurt to get a few more votes. Um, so I wanted to end with some haikus. So the, the volunteers that participate in SETI at Home, we love you guys. And you, a lot of people just donate the, their spare computing cycles. 
biggest computer on the planet, the most sensitive search that's ever been done, incredibly powerful. We're really grateful to the volunteers. But some volunteers want to help us in even more ways. And I, I mentioned, I think, that this big open source project and the volunteers that are good at computing and writing software have helped us find bugs in our code and improve the code and add features and make it run fast on graphics processors. And they do all kinds of things um, and have helped us a lot with the programming. And then some of them that have a little money, they send it in and that's very useful. I like going to my mailbox and getting these donations and, and we use that to, to uh, fund the students during the summer. They work for us and analyze the data. Um, and then, uh, so that keeps the project going. And then uh, there are a lot of ways people contribute. Some people uh, write music and compose music and you can go to the website and listen to songs about SETI and um, there's some artwork. And, and then there are people that compose haikus and there are thousands of haikus that people have sent us. We post them on the website. I'm not gonna read you all, all thousand of them. I'm just gonna read you two. So um, Paula Cook at Duke University, searching for life Answers are revealed about ourselves. And um, last, last slide. Dan Seidner, one million earthlings bounded by optimism leave their PCs on. So thank you very much. So I think, Alan, we have time for questions. More questions? We've got some time. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, SETI notification protocol if you find something? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so what if we really find something? So you were asking about these candidates. What if we get excited about a candidate? What are we going to do? So there's this protocol that all the SETI people got together and tried to figure out how to proceed if we get something interesting. And so what we decided... Because um, that's a real issue. That be contacted. Yeah, right. I think somebody got killed. And, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, right. So... Uh, so what we decided was that before you make a big announcement, you better be pretty sure that you've got something interesting. And so what we decided before you kind of call the New York Times, you should uh, get another group with a different telescope and uh, you ask them to see if they can see it too. So they have to be different people with different equipment and different telescope because it might be like one of my students trying to play a prank on me and they change the software or might be a bug in our code or something like that. So you gotta, you do independent verification. And then if you have two telescopes, like you know, if we had the Green Bank here in West Virginia and Arecibo and they both point at it at the same time, you can triangulate on it, you can measure its distance and make sure it's not coming from a satellite or something nearby that you know, it's coming from some distant star. And then, then you can gain pretty confident that you found something interesting. You may not know that it's ET, so then at that point, we would make a, an announcement, a public announcement, and it would go on our website, and, and we would say, probably we found a really interesting signal. We don't know what it is. This is the frequency, this is the coordinates. You have to say everything, and the protocol says, everything that you know about it, you have to make it public at that point, make it available to everybody. And then we think a lot of people start pointing their telescopes at, you know, I'm sure you guys will go out on that ridge and point your telescope and, and, uh, and, and try to figure out what it really is. And it might turn out, Somebody's asking about can you discriminate natural phenomena. When pulsars were first found, they were called little green men. They didn't know what they were. They bit, 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 this regular thing. And, um, and uh, so it might be some new natural phenomenon. Uh, and so I think it will have to be studied for a long time. And we'll let the. So it's kind of an internal discussion whether it meets the threshold of, okay, this is interesting enough to say, okay, let's tell everybody. Yeah. I mean, we, have, we, we put a list of all the candidates on our website right now, but we don't claim they're extraterrestrial. And we don't claim any of them are interesting. But I think for the threshold to say, this is something interesting, we'd, we'd ask for an independent verification. And, and there is not really, I mean, you don't want to think about this whole research, I think, in terms of close and open. It's not like there is all the scientists in the world in a corner and they do their thing and then one day they come out and make a big announcement. Right? We've seen a lot of that kind of, uh, notion dispelled in the way uh, CERN is being very open about the research and particle physics. Um, you know, there will be, it's going to be open to some extent, right? So at, at the point where um, people have uh, identified interest in candidate, like he mentioned, you know, it's going to be open and well known and people will comment and you get, you know, crazy people making comments on having uh, weird ideas and you have scientists 
promoting uh, throughout the world, uh, you know, doing more research on it. So it's really more like oozing out of that one discovery. Uh, so by the time it gets, I think by the time it really gets determined, oh, it is definitely an extraterrestrial signal, it's gonna be open, you know, out in the open for years, probably. It's not gonna happen already. Yeah, there's lots of different scenarios. It's hard to know exactly how it's gonna happen. And I think a lot of it depends on is it a kind of leakage signal that's coming from them, like a navigational beacon or something that we can't decode? You know, if we get something like their television, and it's not intended for communication with us, we'll probably not be able to make any sense of it. So we'll know they're there, but we're not going to know much else. But if we get a deliberate signal that's sent anti-cryptographically, like they really want to communicate, they'll probably send a lot of pictures and language lessons, and they'll make it easy for us to figure it out. And then, then things will be very exciting. And, um, or blueprints to a spacecraft. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the signals that you've identified as being interesting, uh, have any of them had any kind of modulation on them? No. Just single? Not, yeah. We, the, well, no, that's not quite true. We found a lot of signals that do have modulation, but they're all um, from, from human civilization. We find, we find signals, but they're not extraterrestrial, they're terrestrial, and, and they have modulation on them. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very fascinating presentation on a fascinating topic. But, uh, could you please just, tell, you, tell us something about your team? I mean, uh, how did you collect your team? Uh, what makes your team ticking on it? What, what motivates them and uh, what frustrates them? And where do, where do you get that uh, your picks? Yeah, um, th so I've been doing this for 35 years and haven't bagged an alien. So you might say, you know, why am I getting tired of it? But actually, I'm, I really enjoy this work. You know, it's a really important question, are we alone, is anybody out there? People have been asking this for thousands of years, and our generation is like the first generation that maybe has the technology where we have a chance of answering the question. So I'm motivated by that, but I'm also like a computer nerd, and when I was... In, I love building instruments and I love all the technology and I love teaching students about how to build stuff. I really like to build gadgets and that's what this meeting here was about. And um, So I like that part of it too. And, and, the, and the, the, I think if I were just doing the same thing every year, you know, we started with 100 channels and we kept just doing that same thing year after year after year. After year. But we're always building something new that's much more powerful than the last machine. We've got new ideas, oh let's try infrared. We got this new idea that uh, we're gonna try out here at the Green Bank Telescope that now that we found planets that, where there's a whole system of planets where you have you know, one planet going around the star but then there's a second planet going around the star, maybe multiple planets. So one of the ideas is that suppose you're on a planet in a solar system and your planet gets kind of populated, you might move over to the next planet in your solar system. So maybe, maybe humans will be on Mars someday for instance. And we'll have people there, we'll have people here. Now those planets probably want to talk to each other. And so there, there's going to be radio signals or laser signals or something going back and forth between these planets in, in, the, in, this, in their solar system. So this is the first time, just this year actually, when we actually know when the two planets are going to be in line with Earth. And we actually have that ephemeris data and we know their orbits pretty precisely and we can say, hey look at these two planets in this solar system are lined up with Earth. So if they're talking to each other, we could detect that, intercept that communication. So that's kind of a cool new idea. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. Um, is this idea theoretically possible? Suppose an alien uh, wanted to beam their species genetic code to another planet, and then the scientists there could put together their genetic code, and, and yeah. it would be a way to travel without traveling, except you, you could Right, you could travel at the speed of light. Yeah, you could No. Travel. So. We, I mean, we know how to sequence DNA, you know, we, we could take your DNA and break it down into the 3,000 uh, nucleotide sequence and we could send that out and somebody else, we can't actually build, assemble a thing with 3 billion nucleotides. Right now we can only assemble a thing with 100 nucleotides. But that's, yeah, that would happen. I can imagine that, but on, you know, that doesn't capture your brain. It means they're going to reproduce you as a little kid. And that, yeah, so. Um, but, but maybe we could send out the contents of your brain, too. We don't know how to do that, but my group actually did a little experiment. We get data out of a brain. We get 10 megabits per second. We're using it to control a prosthetic arm 
but, but I can imagine something like that. And then, then you could travel, essentially travel at the speed of light. Maybe not you, but a copy of you. They could make a copy of you. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, but I, yeah, I mean, rocket ships are incredibly slow. You know, 100,000 years to get to the nearest star. But it's only four years if you go, go on a light beam or a radio beam. Yeah. So clearly you have massive amounts of data um, from collections and, and wherever else you've gotten it. Um, has anything else, uh, um, any other uh, information been able to, been, to have been gathered from this data? Uh, like if you... Yeah. Um, so I, there, I hate to justify SETI on spin-offs, but we haven't found ET, so I do, when we write my grant proposal to the National Science Cloud, I do list all the cool things that have come out of it. And... Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't like it when NASA says, "Give us money because we invented Tang and Velcro." But, uh, but they. So I think um, there. The, I think one of the spin-offs I talked about was this idea of volunteer computing and distributed computing and scientific computing and citizen science. Um, then the other kind of technology that happened out of this was um, we developed this uh, these high-speed uh, signal processing boards that are now used all over the world to do astronomy experiments genomics experiments, uh, physics experiments, uh, medical technology. That came out of our SETI work. It turned out we needed these high-speed signal processing things and high-speed digitizers, and, and we, we made these open source hardware, and a lot of people use it now. Um, and what else came out of it? Um, yeah, that's kind of it. Yeah. Oh, and then you asked about the data. So we've actually, we used our data to not just do SETI experiments, but we made a big map of the gas in the galaxy, the hydrogen gas in the galaxy, that was the highest resolution of gas. People use that to find out how stars are forming in galaxies and the, the structure of the, of the Milky Way galaxy. So there have been a few astronomy spin-offs of, from our data, but I would say nothing, nothing really major. Okay. There's been a lot of things written about UFOs. And the idea oh, yeah. That sort of, yeah you know, if you buy the UFO idea, it would be potentially being visited, and they must be communicating with each other somehow. And Right, so um, there, uh, even though I, I think that it's likely that the universe is teeming with life, none of it has ever visited this planet. So I don't, we haven't found anything. There's no evidence that life is out there. So this is just kind of a, just based on statistics of, you know, of that there's a lot of planets and how life might get started. So we don't know, but we... So there's no evidence that life is visited here. A lot of people think that it has because of all this stuff on TV and Eric Von Donegan and you get bombarded with this stuff in all the movies. But I think that these UFO reports kind of fall into three categories. So one is real stuff. And uh, they see stuff in the sky, it's the aurora, or you see the shuttle going over when the, when the shuttle doesn't exist anymore. But when it was docking with the space station, you see these two bright things kind of moving across the sky together. A lot of people would call us and say, UFO, and sometimes the reports would be embellished, you know, it had windows, and, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, so they add a little bit of imagination, but it's real stuff, and we get a lot of calls when interesting things are happening in the sky, and people claim it's, you know, flying saucer and stuff, but we know that, um, um, but, um, and then there's another category um, of kind of things that I think people are, maybe dreamt about or, and we know that uh, we get that these UFO reports correlate with what's in the literature or in the movies. So like when nobody saw flying saucers until Jules Verne wrote about them. Before Jules Verne, people saw a lot of angels in the sky, but they did not see flying saucers. J Jules Verne wrote about flying saucers and then people started seeing flying saucers. So we know it's kind of this suggested so there's a lot of psychology going on there. When Jules Verne wrote about cigar-shaped things, people saw it. And people tend to see aliens that kind of look like what well, in the last summer's movie. And so we know that there's a lot of psychology about that. Um, and then there's some the, the kind of deliberate hoaxes, like uh, there's this place called Area 51 in New Mexico. And they were really doing some real stuff there. But somebody made a, it was a kind of, uh, military top secret stuff with weather balloons and things like that but somebody said they're doing uh, they got aliens there and there's a movie you can see of an alien autopsy from 1951 and you see the autopsy you see the alien there and 
They're working on them with scalpels and stuff. And on the wall from 1951, there's a touchtone phone. And we know that touchtone phones, <laughs> you know, they were dial. I mean, it depends on your age, but you might remember those dial up phones. But anyway, so a lot of it's kind of deliberate hoaxes. And they're not a lot of it, but there's people, yeah. Okay, yeah. I've got two. One, one you may have answered, but how far away would you be able to reliably see us with, with your passive setting, yeah. looking at what emissions have come out of the it's Earth? A, yeah, so um, I think uh, we were talking about that earlier, that TV, we could only see the nearby stars. Unless we, we could see TV further, but we'd have to kind of know that that star was really interesting and, had, and we could stare at it for a really long time and do deep integrations and stuff like that, then we could go further. But the normal kind of raster scanning that we do of the sky, we'd be kind of lucky to find TV. But then the, these ballistic missile early warning radar systems, we could see much further, and then the, the really powerful beams we could see on the other side of the galaxy. But, but part of it, would you even be looking in those frequencies and with enough staring? Probably not. Any kind of no, I think if there's TV out there, we would miss it. If there are ballistic missile early warning radar systems on the nearby planets, we might get them. The other question is sort of geeky, and that is. But I just, uh, just one little more on that is that I think it would be very hard to find uh, civilizations that are just at our level, that just discovered radio. You know, we just found it in a blink just 100 years ago in our 4 billion year history of life. I think if we ever find ET, the most likely civilization will be more advanced than we are, a billion years ahead of us or two billion years ahead of us. In which case, they might have much more powerful transmitters. Um, the other question sort of relates that a little bit. I guess for like the past 20 years, people have been sending more and more signals with coding theory. Yeah. And almost intentionally trying to make the signals yeah, that's look a problem. like noise. Yeah. Because it turns out right. to be efficient. Yeah, so there's a question about this spread spectrum communication. So it used to be that Earth was very easy to detect because, um, I know you understand this, but just um, that they, we transmitted these TV signals. If you looked at them, you see this big spike sticking way up and it was like easy. And now TV signals are kind of spread over the band and they look much more noise like. And so if they're doing that, um, it's going to be much harder to detect them. Yeah. What type of uh, signal to noise ratio do you look for and, uh, that you would classify as an interesting signal? 20 times the noise. If it, if it sticks out 20 times above the noise, it goes into our database. Doesn't mean we call up the New York Times, but it goes into our database. We have about a billion of those in our database. OK, so I, I'm happy to chat more, just maybe one on one, but maybe we should call the formal part of it off. But if you have any more questions or comments, I've enjoyed talking to you. And thanks so much, and I hope you get some clear weather. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.